you are at a really important institution uh, training men uh, to prepare for ministry. And so I'm really excited to be here to share with you the things that God has taught me. And uh, most of it will focus on archaeology today. But I'm excited about God's Word and how archaeology helps us to understand it, uh, <clears throat> helps us to trust it a little bit better, and becomes a wonderful tool that we can use to pass it on to others. And <clears throat> the Master Seminary is part of our uh, consortium for the uh, Kirbet El Makader dig, which is what we're going to talk about. And so this last year we had uh, had Steve and Steve and Mark and, and Holly and, and, and Cynthia, and they all contributed on different levels. Uh, everybody did something, and uh, uh, so many of them in the field, but some back at the... Uh, at, at our headquarters, working on the materials that we excavated every day. And so you uh, you guys were well represented. In fact, Dr. Barrick had that paper there. Uh, disproportionate to your numbers, Mark managed to get in almost every picture. And then Steve got in one or two. And so, uh, so uh, uh, you guys had a really good showing at our excavation this last year. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is a pile of uh, pottery. Uh, every, every piece there and on that pile there, there's, there's, uh, thousands. Every piece, uh, was excavated out of the ground, uh, on the site, brought back, uh, home to the headquarters, was, uh, washed, was soaked and washed and then dried. And then every piece was analyzed front and back, taking a look at it. And then probably one out of 10, maybe 15 pieces we actually keep it it speaks to what we found and it's information that we need to keep to pass on uh to 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 record uh and then to pass on to others uh so that other scholars can compare with what we've got and so all of these pieces um we didn't use and we threw them out and we got this big discard pile uh of sherds and that's that's what uh, that's what this is but uh, and so every people, a lot of times goes, folks say, well, that's all my hard work. Well, it, it was, but be assured every piece was looked at and studied and we've made decisions on it. And, uh, and then of course, guys like Mark at the end of the dig, they go back and pick up a bunch of those pieces and put them in their suitcase and bring them home. Is that right? That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, um, let me just, uh, orient you to where we are, uh, because this is the master seminary, I, I know you know where this is. Uh, what what is this? A Dead Sea. It's the north end. So what's this? That's the Jordan River. So this country today would be, <laughs> and 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 this country over here is. All right. Ooh, ooh, what's that? Yeah, there's the med. All right. This is a Google map, and so um. The Israelites, the, the last place they camped on the east side of the uh, the Jordan, well, they spent the night by the river, but other than that, their campsite, their, where they stayed was at Abel Shatim, probably located right here, and that's actually where I dig in Jordan, uh, and it's probably that location there. Here is uh, Jericho, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the modern city, and then the, the ancient town is right there, and then Kirbet el Makader, which we believe is the city of Ai, is located right up here. So um, here's a view looking from Kirbet el Makader, looking right back to where Abel Shatim probably was located. It's, it's certainly in that area. And now we're at Abel Shatim, that site, Jordan River Valley there, or Jordan River right there, the whole valley. And then we were just, here's Jericho, the old mound, and then we were just right up, up uh, in that area. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, a look at the at the very region we're at uh, in the the north edge of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin goes from right where our dig site is uh, down to Jerusalem, and we're right at the north end of, of Benjamin. And it is our understanding, based first, of course, on the scriptures, but secondly, on uh, the archaeological evidence and the topical and geographical evidence of the region. Uh, we believe that the, the, uh, the eye of Abraham is located at a place called Etel. Uh, the Bible just refers to it as Ha'ai. It doesn't talk about it as having P 
people living there. And in fact, Etel was a ruin in Abraham's day, a massive ruin. And we think that's actually the basis of the very name um, Ha'ai in the scripture. So it is our working hypothesis that this is Ha'ai of Abraham. And then in 500 years, that name moved one, two hills and about six tenths of a mile to the site that's known in Arabic today as Kirbet el Makater. And we believe that that is Ha'ai of Joshua, and it's the city that was uh, destroyed uh, by the Israelites. And then you've got uh, the, the modern cities and the biblical sites, uh, Bethel and Beth Avon uh, in there as well. Now, one of our early reports uh, on the dig site, you need to, um, uh, every year, you need to publish about what you find. Um, you find way too much stuff to do a, a thorough publication, so you give up. A, a summary report in some reputable journal, a, a, a peer-reviewed journal, and we used to publish ours regularly in the Israel Exploration Society. And so one year, um, Dr. Bryant Wood, the, the dig director, decided that he would just put in, after about four or five years, we thought we'd earned the right to, to just put in the note as a final um, uh, a postscript uh, that that our site would seem to fit what the Bible talks about as the city of I of Joshua's day. And uh, and then also made a, a note about this very thing of Etel being the eye of Abraham. Well, the uh, publishers, the editor of IEJ sent back a note and and said, uh, boy, this flies in the face of, of, of everything. How can you possibly say this? And Bryant wrote back and he said, well, the only evidence, the only ancient historical documentary evidence for I is in the Bible. There is no other ancient source. So if there was such a place as I, you got to go to the Bible to find it. And since scholars talk about it, wouldn't it be okay to at least mention that uh, in the article? Well, the editor uh, uh, said, okay. And then the editor actually included that as part of the article, uh, recognizing the validity of the concept. So, uh, so we're, we, that is our working hypothesis. I, I think it makes sense. By the way, I don't know how familiar you are with the Holy Land, but, um, you know, the name Mount Zion, you know about that, right? You read about that. <laughs> uh, well, Mount Zion in the Old Testament, do you know what that was in the Old Testament? It, it was the Temple Mount. Today you go to Israel, and you know where Mount Zion is? It's the next hill over the western hill of the old walled city of Jerusalem. I mean, even Holy Zion moved one hill over the last 2,000 years. And of course, in the, in the Old Testament, the city of David was located where? The biblical name, the city of David, located at, at Jerusalem. In the New Testament, the city of David is Bethlehem. Well, we, we, we know why, but so names can move and names can adapt. And so I don't think there's any problem with our working hypothesis. We can't prove it, uh, but it does seem to fit what the, uh, the biblical text says. So here's our, um, here's our dig site, Kirbet El Makater there. Uh, the, uh, the modern security road going up through the West Bank. This is, this is south. This is north. Over here is the what is referred to as the illegal West Bank settlement, Jewish settlement of Givyat Asaf. Um, it's not; it wasn't something that was recognized and approved by the UN and and everybody involved. But they carved out their own little community. Uh, these are little caravans, little uh, trailers. Now it's much more expanded. This is an earlier picture, uh, and then this is the Palestinian village of Deir Dibwan. And uh, the main village is this way, but this extends right out to the very edge of our of our dig site. So we're located in the West Bank, 10 miles north of Jerusalem, with an illegal Jewish settlement on one side and a, 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 a longtime Palestinian village on the right. And we have um, managed to make have good relations uh, with both all of all of these years. And um, and they've actually both been very helpful to us at, at different times. But it is a, 
it is a little tenuous. Uh, we've never, never been afraid, uh, never fearful for our lives uh, or of danger at all from either sides. Um, uh, and we've had good working relationships with our neighbors there. So here's the dig site. <clears throat> uh, up right there is a Byzantine monastery. For years, explorers noted a church, a chapel, but it was, it turns out it was just the chapel to a greater monastery there. Uh, the ancient city of Ai that Joshua, uh, defeated seems to be about two and a half to three acres right in this area. And then there's a New Testament community, uh, which centers on this area. Uh, but there's probably some more and we certainly found some things down there. This is the gate area of the site facing north. Uh, of the gate area of Joshua City, uh, just like the Bible says. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. Uh, here's what we think the wall looks like. Now, if you, if you read, if you look at archaeological data, you'll see that's, that's pretty impressive. But if you look carefully, the dotted lines means what we think it might look like. And this is the actual only stuff we have found in different areas. And so when you look at something, you need to be honest. Uh, well, they've, they've only found so much. In fact, as you can see, uh, this side, we've got some pretty good evidence. We, we have, this is now off limits to us. We can't dig this any longer, but we found enough things that we, we're making an assumption that it's a mirror image on this side. It may not be, but, uh, we have not found that. We are hopeful that there's still some more to be found as we take out uh, some, some overburden, some of that New Testament village actually take this out. We're going to spend most of our time today right here, uh, because that's where most of our excavation uh, was located this year. Uh, here's, here's, uh, there's three squares, uh, located right here. And this was the center and a little bit off to this side. Uh, we had another half a dozen squares located elsewhere, including mine was off here on, on the edge. But this was the center piece of everything that we were doing this season. Uh, we were looking for part of the wall or any evidence of the gate on that east side, which, which, uh, really did not come to fruition. Uh, when we arrived at the site, uh, local illegal diggers. Now, to be honest, it's illegal to, to dig that way, but they actually do own the land. It's a difficult thing. The Palestinians own the land, uh, but the Israelis uh, can control what they can do with it. And uh, so there's friction. And so, you know, it's my land. If I want to go dig something out of my yard, I'm going to go do it. And uh, so they did. And we do not know what they found. But the things they didn't find, and of course, they know we're coming. They, 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 in fact, it looked like they had just dug before we arrived. It, it, uh, the things that they found that they didn't want they laid up along one of our stone walls. So they did their illegal digging, and whatever they took, we don't know. But what they didn't want, they just laid up on the stone wall, which includes this uh, iron key. And there were two pieces of, uh, two, two just funny-looking pieces of, of iron, and we're, we're looking at them, we're examining as, as we're going to turn them over to someone to clean and make them nice. And one of the, guy, one of the uh, supervisors go, hey, these two fit together. And in, in fact, you can see it's, it's not a pair of pliers. It was ancient tongs. And, uh, and so they got, we, uh, our conservator, uh, fixed them up and that's, that's fixed up, but it's, it's corroded iron, but a couple of amazing pieces. And there was more that the illegal diggers had left out for us. That was very nice. Uh, we would prefer to find them in context. Uh, but you know, we'll take what we can get. Uh, this is on the very first day of the dig. So we found those things as we arrived and that was cool. But then once we started digging on the very first day, this large stone was uncovered and it's part of a wall line and it's, it's got this big hole in the middle. Well, those of us that are used to excavating, um, uh, Old Testament sites, we're, we're quite certain when we see these, what we're looking at are gate socket stones. Ancient doors did not have hinges, uh, uh, up, up against the, um, the side posts of the door. Ancient doors had a socket stone in the floor and one in the ceiling, a wooden post that sat be in between the two stones. And then the door simply was attached 
to the wooden post. And as the wooden post turned in the socket stones, lower and upper, uh, that's how the door opened and closed. And we're very familiar with that with ancient gates. And so we found others. And so when we found this, we were instantly sure that that's exactly what it was. It's just found right at the edge of the gate complex, not in C2, not where it belonged when it was used in the gate, but that was very exciting to us. Now, here's a, uh, a young uh, aspiring archaeologist who found the very first gate stone in 1995. Uh, that was me when I had hair. And, um, and, and, and we found the very first one, and that was very exciting. And that helped us to identify then the gate complex, which was prominent in the, in the story of Joshua. Um, and, and this is what, uh, what we're talking about. Now, here's when you talk about a gate in an ancient city, it wasn't just a door in a wall. It was a gate house, a complex with towers and, and, and rooms. And typically, at least in the Canaanite period, two sets of doors, a set of double doors. Now the arrows are on the outside of the gate, outside of the city. This is inside the city. Uh, two sets of double doors on the outside of the gatehouse, and then a set of double doors on the inside, and you see those little circles. Those represent the socket stones where the doors opened and closed. So you had a, a door that opened and closed there, and, this, and that closed the outside, and then you had the same thing on the inside. And so uh, I had identified the first socket stone uh, from the gate complex. It was not in C2, but it was nearby. Then we found a second uh, socket stone right there. Here's the third one. And the fourth one should still be laying out there somewhere. Uh, we haven't found it, but we did find one of the upper socket stones that would have gone along with one of the lower. So we've got the three of the lower stones that would have been in, in those three of those four socket stones. And then we've got uh, one of the upper and, um, and so that was very exciting to us. Now, the the uh, the end of that first week, the beginning of that first week was that socket stone. Huge for us, goes back to the city of Joshua, we're certain. Then at the end of the week on Friday, uh, we, we're, we you dig down to bedrock. Archaeologists dig in the dirt down to bedrock looking for the remains of human civilizations. Paleontologists work in the bedrock, fossils and dinosaur bones. Well, we dug down to bedrock at a square just next to where that socket stone was found. And, and can, can you, can you tell what it is? Now, this has all been carved, but there's a, there's a, a, a hole carved in the ground, obviously. And this is a capping stone above it. Man, I, I've seen Indiana Jones and, and National Treasure, you know, underneath there. What could be found? It was Friday afternoon, and we had to go back. We had to stop digging and go back for the weekend. And we couldn't dig it till Monday morning. Because once you open it up, if there's cool stuff in there, you got to finish it. Because if you don't, yeah, th those other guys will. So, great, great discipline. We, um, we left the stone intact. But then we had to bury it again so that nobody knew it was there. And we were gone all weekend and come Monday morning, you know, I, and now this was not my square, but, uh, you know, I kept, I kept walking over to check what was going on. <laughs> Can't you get that thing clear any quicker? Well, and you can see now this is the afternoon sun and, and, and it's actually in the shade of a little, little rise over there. So that was the afternoon of Friday. You ready for this? Monday morning, we took out the capstone and a little Canaanite popped out. <laughs> um, uh, 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 that, is, that is petite little Sally. Uh, she's actually a, 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 an electrician. Uh, she, that's what he, she does for a living. Uh, I can't remember where she lives. But, uh, you know, it took somebody small to get down that hole to get down there. And Sally and then another young guy cleared that thing out. 
uh, force. Um, no treasure. In fact, it was basically just dirt. And it took almost a whole week to get all the dirt uh, out of out of that hole. Um, now, here's here's a guy. This this is a gal. This is how we get the dirt out of the hole. And of course, this would be the same way that they got the dirt down. There's the other kid that uh, helped clear it out. This, this is the only way you could get stuff down in there and get it out, let alone somebody hewing it out. What it would take to carve this thing out, one small person starting from the top and then working their way down, it really was an amazing feat. It's not building the pyramids in Egypt, but it's pretty, uh, quite impressive what they managed to do. And we got it all done and dirt and a, a few coins. And that was all coins from the, the New Testament era. Well, then we found another hole carved in bedrock and then another hole carved in bedrock. And then this massive, uh, and there, they, these would all be underground storage silos, this massive one. Now here, they aren't uh, all the way to the bottom, but they actually cleared this from the bottom. is about eight feet wide and about eight feet deep. And obviously it's almost like a cellar and they'd act, the excavators identified not, not good steps, but stones that would even place to be as steps to go down into this subterranean cavern. So we wound up uh, with, with five underground silos and then additions, additional stone cut installations in the, uh, in the New Testament era village. Here was a, a mikvah uh, that was that dug out, a ritual bath on the other end of the, uh, of the site. And, uh, and then what came out of all of these holes were coins. Coins, 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 coins. 205 of them, to be exact. In fact, excavators, you're digging out, you're trying to be careful. You, you got everything you could find, and we get two. Then a gal with a metal detector came by on the dirt we had just dug out, the dirt we had just carefully dug out, and she'd find 10. And we wound up from these holes in the ground with 205 coins. It was an incredible haul of New Testament era, a little, little before come of them, because uh, coins were, were kept in circulation for 100, 200 years. But uh, New Testament era coins, um, and we haven't, they all, the 205 of them, they all haven't been cleaned and identified uh, since the dig in May. But in the past, the coins we have found in the past, uh, they all end at 70 A.D. As the Romans come south to Jerusalem, they apparently wiped out our city as well, our village as well. And the coins cease until the Byzantine monastery that we showed you up on the hill. Um, this is the 128 coin crowd. And wouldn't you know, Mark got himself in that picture. Um, there's Dr. Barrick. Uh, there's metal detector girl. And um, we, we have not, um, archaeologists don't like metal detectors. But to be honest, the locals have discovered them. And if we don't learn how to use them effectively, uh, we're going to miss out on so much stuff. So we've, archaeologists, you never dig holes. You always dig a, a, an, an area out. We call it a locus. You always dig a, a defined area out. Always, always think of it as um, the way you, en you, you empty the bathtub. You fill the bathtub with water. That We would call that a locus. The bathtub interior is, is a locus. And you empty the dirt in your locus like you empty the water out of the bathtub. When you pull the plug out of the drain here, your bathtub doesn't drain like this. It all goes down even. And so when you excavate your locus, it's supposed to go down even because that helps you to know how things are interconnected. So we got down this, this, uh, uh we, we, we would, we would do the best we could, but you know, do go so far. So we began to learn how to use these metal detectors and, uh, and do them right. And we didn't dig holes. And certainly after we dug dirt, we sifted it. And uh, most of our coins were found that way. She's actually standing, standing down in the hole. She's a, she's a, 
She's a food scientist. She was one of the people on the team that made sun chips. You ever had any? What do you think? Huh? Well, anyway, she's one of those people to blame. Uh, but, but, and there's, that's Dr. Bryant Wood, who's uh, the dig director. So the most coins came out of Dr. Barrick Square and this hole, and they had 128 of our 205 coins from the entire dig season. It was, it was an incredible bonanza. Uh, one of the Israelis who works uh, for the Department of Antiquities there, he actually said he has never seen one location come up with so many coins uh, as this one hole did. It was an amazing situation. I honestly don't know how people kept dropping coins down in there. You know, it wasn't a wishing well. I, I, you don't know what they were thinking, but uh, it was to our benefit to, uh, to get those. And uh, there's Dr. Barrick again. I'm blaming Mark for getting in all these pictures, but Dr. Barrick did okay. This is a, um, a, a Roman jar, large storage jar, uh, that he excavated all the way down to the base and sitting on a little, even a little bit of a pedestal there. It was uh, an amazing uh, feature. And then here's, uh, uh, this is stoneware. We read about uh, stone uh, storage jars in the New Testament and the ritual cleansing. Well, they, the Jews were used stone stoneware to do that pieces of stoneware there dr barrick pulls up a uh, stone cup it was it's uh, this soft chalky jerusalem limestone that actually uh, you could pair it like with a knife like you would uh, some 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 food some fruit and uh these are this is actually from uh, i took from an, a magazine uh, from biblical archaeology review years ago but this is a bunch of stoneware and bill this is very similar to yours uh, did yours have a handle broken off? It was broken off. Uh, so it, it, but it had. It was obvious it was broken off. Looked just like this one um, that came from from Jerusalem. And then you, uh, there's just you know that's stone. That's that's a that's a stone ritual vessel. Looks like the cup I had coffee in this morning. And then and then talk about the um, the, the 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 seven the six storage jars when when uh, uh, of stone jars that Jesus. Uh, that were used in the miracle of the, of the water to wine. Well, these are stone uh, lathed storage jars all coming from the burnt house in Jerusalem, the big jars and then the small cups uh, like Dr. Barrick had found. Uh, then the, uh, can you see it? Can you see the ring? A small iron ring. Um, now, iron vessels, uh, iron was a, a prized commodity during the time of the judges in the Old Testament. Um, and we actually have iron bracelets, bangles would be the better word, that were found on skeletons in, tomb, in a tomb at, at, at one of our nearby sites that we excavated back in the 90s. So we've got these two leg bones with these two iron bangles uh, just laying there in the, in the tomb. Well, this one, uh, this is ring size, and uh, probably not, once we really looked at it, probably not uh, ornamental jewelry, but probably a, a ring of an iron ring of utilitarian value from some sort of a tool, uh, probably. But there it was, probably from New Testament times, uh, not from Old Testament times. There's a a, a lamp. It's a Roman lamp. It's a Herodian style. Everything but but just a little bit of the spout. And of course, I assume you would know uh, it was it, it was an oil lamp. You would pour the oil in here. You can even see where there would have been some sort of a lid that would fit nicely on there. You uh, flick a, a stick of flax uh, wick there, flick a bick on the wick, and you've got a, a, a light. Um, these were three whole lamps that were found this year. Um, this is the earliest one. It's it's actually more like a, I, I would have called it Persian, but we've got no other evidence of Persian material. So it must be a, an early Greek lamp. It's it's the last of the Old Testament a handmade bowls, and then they started as bowls, then they folded the bowls in and in and in and in, and then finally in the Greek period, they stopped making these handmade bowls, but they started making uh, lamps out of molds, and that's what this is. So this is probably early Greek period, uh, the Roman period, and uh, this one, uh, it, 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 it's either late Byzantine or early Islamic. Um, all three of these were found uh, this season. Um, Talk about these subterranean um, 
installations. This is that that large, a very large mikvah, mikvah surprisingly large in the New Testament uh, village. Uh, these gals excavated something else that we thought was going to be another mikvah, but it turns out it's a series of underground rooms with passageways that uh, maybe um, indicate a hideout, a, a Jewish revolt hideout from the Romans at maybe the first, uh, the, the destruction of the, uh, the first revolt, 70 AD, or maybe the second Bar Kokhba revolt, um, 132. So we're not sure which, uh, we, we didn't even get to finish it. In fact, this December, uh, part of our team, uh, with Dr. Scott Stripling is going to try to, to identify, uh, completely clean that out. And Dr. Brian Wood's really interested in these big stones. Um, they're called orthostats, uh, ortho for straight, like orthodontist, uh, straight, large, uh, uh, stones. And, um, those often were used in Canaanite city gateways. And, uh, how in the world these massive, large stones got down in this hole? We have no idea. And, uh, we're wondering how they might relate to anything, but we're particularly interested in how it might relate to the gate. Uh, the reason these are in here, um, uh, this is all that I can show you from my square. Uh, these are uh, seven sling stones from a house. I was digging an Iron Age one Book of the Judges Israelite house. Did not get down to the floor, but as we're digging down through, we found these. And so I just wanted you to know I did something. And uh, this is Destry. And um, uh, Destry is 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 digging, and you know it's just it's just dirt and rocks and you're just cleaning it up and trying to be careful and she's she's digging and she she she's putting stuff in the dustpan and then putting in a goofer to be dumped and and uh and this funny looking little rock and she thought oh, it's funny and cleans it off a little bit and takes over to the square supervisor and says um is this anything and the supervisor cleaned it off a little bit and goes oh it is and in fact it became the find of of the dig um, you know what that is? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a beetle, but the Latin word is scarab. You know what that is? It's also a scarab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trick question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, scarab's the Latin word for a, a, a dung beetle in particular. You can see that the top of a scarab, that's why they called it a scarab, because it, it, it was designed to look a, a bit like a, a dung beetle. And then, but the underneath side is a seal. And so the ancient Egyptians were the people who did this. Uh, the hieroglyphic name for this is a kefir, but, um, uh, we know, we know them by the Latin name, uh, scarab. And actually, Kefri is, is the Egyptian, one of the Egyptians' gods, and he had a, a beetle head, and so Kefri, Kefri, scarab, that's, that was a very common, uh, concept, and there are just, there are just thousands and thousands and thousands of them, uh, in Egypt. Not nearly so many in Canaan, but lots of them in Egypt. So here's, um, here's a look at what Destry found uh, in the ground. Let me say that ain't much. Um, uh, that 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 hole. This is you know this is. I, I guess you figured this out. That's one side, and then this is the other side. So that hole actually uh, goes all the way through. But um, uh, you've got this hole on both sides uh, of the uh, of the thing. Here's this the other side. Look how it looks, and then this is the top. And this is the bottom of our scarab. They're not found very often. Uh, this is the, the first time I found one. I, we found one on the, on the Jordanian side. The first time we ever found one at, at, in my uh, 13 years of excavation in the West Bank. And here it is. Now, um, Dr. Barrick did not find it, but you, you would have thought he did because he really got into this. Uh, got online over there in, in, there we are. When we go back to our dig headquarters at night, he's, he's staying up late and finding all kinds of stuff out. And he was sort of the local expert for us who was sort of cluing us in 
while we still have this thing in the field, what is it we actually have and what are we going to do with it? So uh, I asked him if he would just say a little bit. I asked him if he'd said much to you and he said he, he hadn't. So uh, Dr. Bear, come on up and if you want to use my pointer to point out some stuff, uh, this is really, for for those of us who came to dig this, the, jo- the eye of Joshua, this is a big deal. When you look at this scarab, <laughs> notice a couple of things. Number one, yeah. The symbol here on the right is the Egyptian symbol, the Ankh symbol, that is a life symbol. And then the creature here that you see with the tail and the rear haunch here that is very articulated is, uh, and the head would be the head of an eagle. And uh, the body of a beast here, four legs on it, and this is a griffin. And uh, when you look at this in combination, you find out that uh, this is a scarab that is Canaanite, not Egyptian, and it's from a very specific period of time. Daphna ben Tor is the leading expert on the scarabs in Canaan and in Israel. And in her book in 2007, she described the kind of Canaanite scarabs, like what you see here, and she mentioned that they're the ones with griffins, they're the ones with mythical creatures, they're the ones with uh, the symbols that have to do with mysticism and with good luck charms. Uh, so that uh, this, as you look at it, is very distinctive in that regard, and it comes from only one period of time. And the Israel Antiquities Authority, when they took this from us to examine and then returned it later with their, returned the report later, confirmed what Daphna Bentor has written as the expert on the subject in her book, that the date for this particular scarab is 1550 to 1400 B.C., there's only a 150-year period in Canaan that this exact kind of scarab had been uh, uh, created or had been made. This is made of glass. It's only about 19 to 20 millimeters uh, in length. It's very light. It's very small. The hole would be on a string to wear around the neck so it wouldn't get lost, could be taken and used as a seal, but it was basically a good luck charm. And uh, this then helps us to be able to date the city, because this says that uh, this is before the time of, or about the same time at the end of that period of time, be about the time of the conquest of Canaan under Joshua. So this is uh, where it was found, was with a context of Middle Bronze Age pottery shards, and it was in an area of the uh, city that uh, was somewhat influential, and it has great promise for the future, and the key find of 2013. In fact, Dr. Wood would say the, the key find of the dig, I think, in uh, 11 seasons, it was, it was remarkable. So we have pottery that helps us to date our destroyed small fortress uh, of, of I. And now this independent confirmation is, uh, is very exciting for us. Now, just real quickly, uh, th- we didn't dig the monastery, but I just wanted to show you uh, – because just some lace of stuff. This is the plan of that monastery. Uh, what, what do we think it looked like? And I just put this up here because we just got it this week. Our, our architect is Dr. Lane Rittmeyer, who is probably the most, the, the one man alive today who has seen, photographed, measured, and drawn more of the Temple Mount than anybody. I refer to him as the Temple Man because he is just the international expert. No Jew, Muslim, or Christian has ever seen more uh, alive today, seen more to tell about than Lane Rittmeyer. And he's, he's the uh, architectural architect the, uh, um, um, for us at both of my digs. And so Lane just finished this drawing. This is a, a, a rough drawing. And he said, if, if make corrections and then I will pen and ink it and get it ready. But this is what our monastery looked like. Here's the chapel and then the forecourt. And then there's additional buildings over this way that we haven't even begun to excavate. Uh, but this is a very exciting look at us, and it gives a real f- sense of the Byzantine church. Uh, the Byzantines always built churches on holy sites, Old Testament or New Testament. There's no record of Jesus doing anything in this region, so we assume the monastery was built for an Old Testament event. And it would seem to us that the Old Testament event that it's built to re- remember is uh, Joshua's capture and destruction of the city of Ai. Um, we have local workers, local Palestinian workers who uh, help us. We pay them and they help us. It's part of our goodwill gesture. Uh, the, uh, she's the youngest square supervisor on our team. It's about her fifth season. 
She's in her early, in her mid twenties and, uh, just a great, just a, a good, uh, young archaeologist and a great worker. That's what the ladies on our dig do. That's what the guys on our dig do. Um, and then I'll show you this picture of a bunch of old guys. Um, we're, we're, this is where you read the pottery uh, after the uh, the dig season, uh, after, after each day. You, you, you dig it out of the ground, you wash it, you let it dry a day. And then today we dig, we, we work, we analyze yesterday's pottery. Look at all the old bald heads. Um, and their white hair, you know, this is a bunch of old guys. You know what we need? We need some young blood. We need some young men and women who, who really have a, a passion. And I'm talking about this stuff and it's just talking to you like, like it did to me 30 years ago. Just talking to you. And you say, man, I, I need to do something like this. Um, some of you not only could put yourself in one of the photographs, but some of you could become part of the team that really, really brings new insight to the world about, about biblical truth based on archaeology. I, I got enough time here to share um, a final thought with you. Um, this, again, was our that major area where most of the excavation went. Um, this square right here, uh, this guy originally... Uh, supervised this square four years ago. Now, Dr. Bryant Woods, my boss, he's, he's the expert and, uh, he was my archaeological mentor. And Dr. Wood, uh, four years ago told me to get this, um, uh, go ahead and excavate this square. Now we dig in, in five meter squares with a, a, an extra line of an extra meter on two ends. And that's to control things. And so you, you take your bathtub water down level in sections in the entire five meter square. Now, all archaeologists don't dig the whole five meters, uh, but Dr. Wood likes to get that done. And so we got started four years ago and I had, I had Jim start on the west side and I had him take two meters on the west side. And there was just, we hit the bedrock within, within 18 inches and there was just nothing there. Well, I'm, I'm the administrative director. I've been with Dr. Wood all these years from the beginning. So I made a management decision. It's stupid to dig the rest of this square out because obviously there's nothing there. And we're, we're short of time. We're short of people. And so I, Jim finished that up and I had him relocate to somewhere else where he found nothing. But that's, you know, I can do that. Well, um, four years later, Dr. Wood says again, I want that square finished. And he's the boss. And so, you know, this time we did it. And turns out Jim hadn't been back since, but Jim was back. So we put Jim back in the same square. So this is the part he dug earlier. We filled it back in. So now they're finishing the other uh, two, th uh, three meters. It's in that, it's, it's right over here. That's where they found that socket stone. Now, if I had just listened and had not made up my own mind about what was best, we'd found that four years ago and I'd be a genius. Here we are four years later and I, I realize how pathetic I really am. Um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, our God, and, and, and Jim, Jim actually told the story, he says, you know, three years ago I found nothing. I, four years ago I was really discouraged. And it's just really nice that God let me come back and supervise when we find that, that, that socket stone. Um, the God of the Bible, our God, is so good and so gracious. Um, I, I, uh, this is a concept I talk about a lot with the men that I work with. All the men in my program uh, are men struggling with drug or alcohol addiction. And I talk to them about this concept how to access God's plan for my life. And you know the verse. And I, I love this verse. And, and the way it's written, it sounds like a God in the past, it's not sound, it's true, he planned, he planned a plan for us, but the way he says it, I still know what it's like. The plan that I planned for you is still in force. The warranty is still good. It's still under contract. In spite of all the stupid stuff you've done, the plan is still good. 
it's still in force. The warranty is good. Still guaranteed. And the plan, of course, is to prosper. That doesn't mean make you rich, but you'll be all right. Prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, I, I've got the word how in capital letters because this has become such a great concept for me. And the older I get, the, the, the more I try to simplify how this stuff works. And here's how it works for me. How do you get some of this? How do you plug into this? Well, using the word how, H-O-W, there's a concept that comes from recovery. And it's just a really biblical concept. Honest, open, and willing. When you and I stay honest with God about where we really are today and open to what God is saying to me through circumstances and situations today and willing to just step out and attempt to do the things I think he wants me to do right now, when we stay this kind of guy, we can't miss. Four years ago, if I'd practiced that on the dig site, we would have found that thing. But Gary did what Gary does. And so still grateful I got to see it four years later. And, and it all worked out. But that's God. And I so, you know, because of all this, and I spent a lot of time working on all this stuff and thinking this stuff and teaching this stuff, I've actually developed my own definition of spirituality. I don't know if this will pass theology class uh, that you guys are taking, but um, I, I, I ask you on a practical level to improve on that, and I'm not sure you can. Here's how you walk a spiritual walk. You do it before God. This is always me and God. Always, always God conscious. And to the best of my ability, and that's going to be imperfectly, I'm going to try to be that honest, open, and willing guy one day at a time. I got to thinking, I can't think of a command in the, in the scriptures. I can't think of a command in the Bible that you wouldn't fulfill if you just simply lived and worked and walked like this. I've been working it now for quite a while. It's working pretty good for me. So if this talks to you, give it a good run. Because the God of the Bible has got the coolest plan for your life. And as you stay honest, open, and willing, it'll be so easy for him to direct you. And even when you get off, he hook you right back up and reconnect you. It's been my joy to share with you about what happens at Kirbet el Makater. And I'm hoping that God's talking to some of you. Some of you maybe need to be part of the team for years to come to make a real contribution in the field of biblical archaeology. Maybe you're just going to come one time. Or maybe you won't come at all, but you'll, you'll begin to think about all this stuff differently and you'll begin to see the value and use, uh, all the advantages of biblical archaeology as we, uh, as we begin to take the message of a God who's got the coolest plan for everybody's life. We take that message to anybody who's available and willing to listen and hear it. Well, bow with me, please. Father, I, I thank you. It's been my privilege to be here today. I thank you for uh, the chance to share with my brothers the things that you're doing in my life and for the, the wonderful experiences as we actually uncover uh, things related to the biblical world. Uh, and Lord, how they relate, how they help us to appreciate exactly what the scriptures say. Bless the uh, each one today, their studies, pressures at home, ministry responsibilities. You know where we are. You know what we need. And I commit us all to that plan one day at a time. And I ask you to help us to stay honest, open, and willing to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name, amen.